Have you found the keys to unlock your best trip? On a Trafalgar tour, you unlock more than just the world. We give you the keys to discover real connections and one-of-a-kind experiences. It all starts with expert itineraries where everything is taken care of. With Trafalgar, your money goes further, and so do you. Unlock your best self. Discover more at trafalgar.com slash unlock. That's T-R-A-F-A-L-G-A-R dot com slash unlock. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. How's it going and welcome to episode 65 of On The Wire, proud member of the Pitcherless Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. Of course, if you're listening on a platform that allows ratings and reviews, please take a second to let us know what you think. I am Adam Howe. You can follow me on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. I'm once again joined by my co-host Kevin Hastings, who himself should be followed on the Twitter at Hasting Kevin, I texted you last night. I it's been two and a half years, sadly, but I finally got to a professional baseball live professional baseball game. The family got me tickets to a game, the Indianapolis AAA team for the Pirates for Father's Day, and we cashed them in on a Friday night. Kids surprisingly stayed up all night, watched fireworks. That was pretty cool. First fireworks I've seen live that. I wasn't looking out my how my home window and it was just neighborhood fireworks going off in probably eight years just because I've got gotten over those, but they loved it. So that's cool. But it was just, it was great to be at a field and watch actual baseball happening in front of my eyes. It, yeah. Just want to throw that out there for everybody who hasn't had the chance to finally do, or I'm sure there's lots of people out there who have gotten many more chances than me. And I'm finally in that boat. That felt good. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I had the exact response when I got your text that a little bit later when you posted the same picture on Twitter that Michael Carter had. Beautiful. It's just a beautiful (laughs) view. It's just awesome being at the ballpark. Yeah, very happy for you that you were able to make it out. And kids making it up and through fireworks, that is a feat in and of itself. It's pretty impressive. It was impressive. I was impressed with both of them. And lawn seats, Never sat in the lawn, to be honest, and never sat in the lawn. Now I got kids. It's the only place I'm going to sit. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Unless I go to a game by myself, which there sure will be plenty of those. But if I'm with them, I'm not chancing trying to chase them around the seats and having them be uncomfortable. It's just that was the perfect environment for them to enjoy the game. The only thing is you and the other attendees at that game are the only people in the country that wish O'Neill Cruz had oh not been God. called up yet. I know. Yeah. We, it's like I, every time I wanted to go to a game this year, all of a sudden they started losing Contreras. And then they lost Cruz. We had Swaggart. He was, in, it was playing left field. Oliva was playing center field. So we had, there are a couple of guys out there and Jared Hicks was playing for the opposing team, St. Louis. Jordan Hicks was playing for the other team. So we got him, he got in there for an inning of work as well. So we got some names. It was still nice. fun, no matter what. Very nice. All right. We are going at it solo as, as much as two people can go at something solo. And we are going to go, we are without our, our regular scheduled guest this week. So Kevin and I are just going to hit the ground running here, go right into our news and notes. We got quite a bit to talk about. So Kevin, I'm just going to fire these right at you. And let me see, let me get your take on some of the stuff that we've seen happen this week that might affect our fab considerations of this coming Sunday night. Less so about fab and picking somebody up this first bit, but it's more about whether or not you're planning on dropping him in order to pick somebody up this coming fab. That's Andrew Heaney. He's back in the IL and just right to it. Is he worth holding, especially if you already held him? through his last IL stint, are you holding on at least just one more week to see what the length of stay might be? Or are you just, no, this is it. This is a really tough one. And it will be tough for a lot of people come to this evening, Sunday evening. It really depends on your team. That's a cop-out answer. But 
I think we don't know yet. They've been very vague. Dave Roberts said on Friday that he's hopeful Heaney will be clear to return after missing just a few starts. Oof. What does that what does mean? A few mean? Yeah. And he's on the 15 day <laughs> injured list, but it's going to be longer than 15 days, but that his current absence will be shorter than his two month stint. So between two weeks and two months is what we know right now. I think <laughs> if you need the spot, you have to let him go in, in FBC type formats and many other leagues out there with that. We have very short bench and limited IL spots you would be forced to let him go. He would be one of the first guys I would reluctantly let go. If I can, I'm trying to hold on for one more week till, till we get more news. The other thing that makes it a little easier in my mind to let him go if we need to is it's the same shoulder, right? We don't know exactly what the injury is. They right. haven't told us, just inflammation, but it's the same shoulder that he already missed two two months with. So when you play that factor in as well, if you have to let him go, that it makes it a little easier. It's probably what's going to end up happening anyway, but I'd like to wait a week if I can. Yeah, exactly. If I have the flexibility, sure, why not? Why not hold off that one week? You hope you'd have more information in just a week's time. It's, I think it's going to be difficult for a lot of people to drop them only because he was out for so long with that shoulder. And he can't, when he finally did come back, yeah, he had some rehab. And he did pretty good. But when he came back, he was really effective in that one start. Seven strikeouts and only in five innings, only let up one run. And so you see Even, that and you're like, if he comes back, he'll be good right away. There's absolutely no guarantee. I think I'll echo what you said. My biggest concern is just that it's the same injury. If it was a different part of his body, it was a new injury, I'd be less concerned. Yeah, and... This is a guy that for several years we thought could be as good as he was early this season. Mm -hmm. Now with the Dodgers, he showed it to us. Everybody's ecstatic. And it's not just the people that held him. I don't think there's very many that did. But the ones that two and three weeks ago planning on him coming back and scored him in fab and then got that one outing, so happy about it. It's going to be tough to let him go. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's go to another IL stint up in Seattle. Ty France is, is heading to the IL with a grade two flexor strain. He is optimistic, at least in his words, he, that he won't miss much time. Hopefully not much more than the minimum stay on the 10-day IL, perhaps about two weeks or so. But that's two weeks is two weeks. It's still going to impact who's playing in Seattle, who's not. So who do you think is is in line to add more playing time, whether it's at first base, second base, somewhere else in that time that France is out? All of the infielders, because several of them move around. And Dylan Moore's been getting quite a bit of playing time anyway. I think this kind of cements it for the next couple of weeks. And they have a seven-game week coming up. What's interesting about Dylan Moore is it's not good in five by five roto and in the obp leagues i play in they're six by six where we add slugging and he's slugging to something so he's not even a consideration mm -mm. but in a five by five league that uses obp instead of batting average he's a three category contributor so those are the leagues where i might be looking dylan moore's way he does have eight stolen bases on the season five of them in the last three weeks since he started playing more often and they have a seven game week, as I said, coming up. So in a five by five OBP league, I have some interest in Dylan Moore. Otherwise, I, I think it's going to be mix and match with the other infielders. Abraham Toro is going to get more playing time. Cal Raleigh, when he's DH, Torrens has been moving in there still. It's not like he was last year, but the, the the everyday DH now is Justin Upton. That's another thing. I want to talk about Justin Upton just for a bit because I'm, I couldn't I bring myself. <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to put him in our power categories later because he hasn't done anything yet. And in fact, I would didn't even realize he had been signed by Seattle. We did this show last week. He'd already been signed. <laughs> we didn't even talk about him. He and, got signed to a minor league. He got signed to a minor league deal. Then, but he played on right? Saturday as we were sure. recording. He played on Saturday and then he played in both games of the doubleheader on Sunday. He hadn't done much. He's hitting 130. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but he does have a hit in four of the last five games. He is the designated hitter every day in the lineup this past week. And we know that Justin Upton is going to go on a run. So I do does. have some interest here. And it, 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 if I have a spot, he's somebody I'm interested in. I'm not putting him in my lineup right away, even with the seven game week coming up because his hot streaks are typically pretty long. When he gets in a groove, he usually sustains it. So we could wait, we can see something. He starts hitting and then throw him in our lineup. Not somebody I'm putting in a lineup in right away, but <laughs> when looking at the Mariners, yeah, the infield, they're going to move some guys around to will get a more playing time or will get more playing time. But as far as the Mariners go, I'm like, Justin Upton's probably going to do something at some point this summer. And I'd like to have him in my lineup when it happens. Yeah. I would have liked to have put well, I'm going to just as my unofficial Dylan Moore into the speed category that we're going to talk about a little bit later, only because when he does get on base, he does get the opportunity. He's taking over 30% of those yeah. opportunities to steal. Like you mentioned, he's got all those stolen bases as he's got his playing time racked up. He also has one caught stealing recently, three on the season. So he's not perfect out there. Seattle has always let Dylan Moore run. He just It's just what they do. He's no John Birdie, but he's hes going to do what he's going to do. The problem right. and, with and Moore... And a 170 batting average is horrendous. <laughs> we can't sustain that. But a 342 on base percentage works for the Mariners and works for OBP League fantasy players. It does. Yeah, he hasn't had a hit since the 18th of June, but he's but walked like that four time, or five times. his OBP yep. is well over 300 exactly. as well. I looked at that earlier. <laughs> So he doesn't need to hit if as long as he gets on some base and all we want is a stolen bases. That's all we care runs. about. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we always forget runs is a category, guys. <laughs> runs is a category. Exactly. All right, let's another IL stand a little bit longer this time down with the Dodgers. Daniel Hudson, he is done for the season with an injury to his ACL. There were plenty of people stashing Hudson in with a hope or expectation even that Dave Roberts would come to his senses and start sitting Craig Kimbrell in the closer role and move Hudson back or into that position. That's obviously not going to happen. Whether or not Kimbrell does lose that job at some point doesn't remains to be seen, but Hudson's not going to get it. So if you were stashing Hudson for that reason, are you looking for another Dodger reliever to stash or are you simply taking your chances elsewhere? I'm probably going elsewhere because, as you said, it wasn't going to happen anyway. It's probably going to take an injury. If I was looking at the Dodgers, I'm just just going down the list, and I'm probably looking at Gratterall. But I think there's better options. And, and for saves, there's a guy or two this week. Usually I leave that section blank and say, I'm just holding <laughs> the ones I got. But there's actually a guy or two I'm interested in this week, so I'd probably move in another direction. All right. So somebody we talked about last week, uh, Jonathan VR, he was DFA'd. So if you were like me and you took that advice and picked him up in a couple places, hopefully you were able to get him out of your lineups <laughs> as I was scrambling to get him out of four out of four lineups <laughs> this past week when I saw the news before lineups locked on Friday. Can you see VR getting a new home somewhere where he can actually be utilized more often than he was with the Cubs? Hopefully. And we weren't the only ones scrambling. The Cubs were scrambling. Yeah. He was in the starting lineup. He was yeah. in the starting lineup when he got DFA. That is crazy. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen that before. We've seen guys get traded. Traded, right before, sure, sure. But not DFA. The thing with Jonathan VR, he's obviously going to get offers. And he has his pick of the litter of all the offers he gets. He's going to get paid the same contract regardless. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of where he wants to go. So I think it's it really depends on how picky he wants to be. For us, we're hoping he's not picky. He takes one of these first offers that comes along from a, a team that maybe they're hoping to contend or even better probably is if they're not a contender like right. when he was in Baltimore in 2019. That's what we want. He has the luxury of being picky, and if he's – willing to play part-time, be a utility guy, do what he was doing with the Mets, he could probably go to a contender if he waits it out. So I'm hoping that he signs with a lesser team right away. And we would know that this week. So it's another guy like I, if I could, I'd probably hold him this week. Yeah. I if think I can't, I drop him this week, but he is going to sign with somebody. Sure. And I think he can end up with a contender 
by the end of the year, no problem. Even if he ends up with a lesser team who's Matt, just going to give him, that's the ideal situation. Because right? the he lesser goes, team's going to play him every day. Every day, showcase him. So they get something for him. He's going to end up on the Mets no matter what type of thing. <laughs> Sorry, Mets fans. And yeah, let's just cross your fingers that that's the case. We'll see that happens in the next 48 hours. But more than likely, it won't happen until after Fab has run. So you'll have to cross your fingers on that when you have to make your decisions. All right, Kevin, Kansas City, they have their Edward Oliveira's back. He's back again, this time just coming back from a rehab assignment. Not so much an option or anything like that, but... Should Oliver's be keeping the engine running for a trip back to Omaha or is he back for good, if you will? I think he's probably back for good. Hitting, hitting you don't sound very first... excited about that. It, well, <laughs> because it, we're getting close to the trade deadline. Benintendi is probably gone. Michael A. Taylor might be gone. Even with Merrifield could finally be traded as many Royals fans have wanted for three years now. Any or all of these really open up a, a full-time spot for him. Right now, they still have all those guys. Whit Merrifield's been playing second base recently. Edward Oliveris is in the, was in the lineup again today. And hitting a home run in your first two at-bats back from rehab assignment doesn't hurt your chances to stick with the team. So <laughs> I, I think he's probably back for good, but there is that slight possibility if they don't start making some of these trades soon, then there might be one more trip back to Omaha, but I, he's back by the trade deadline, I would expect, if that happens. Yeah, I think what's really, lo I've lost track of myself, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, trade deadline's only a couple weeks away. July is around the corner next weekend. Yeah. July and, 31st, so we got like five weeks from today. And so I think we've been seeing some bigger trades happen two or three weeks before the deadline, and then obviously the deadline, and the deadline was set this year in a timely fashion so that it automatically is going to be a little bit more conducive for more trades to happen and not during the day, not during the weekend, if I'm not mistaken, because it no longer has to be on the 31st. It just has to be set by the commissioner around the 31st. And so it might be pretty, it might be pretty interesting to watch. All right. Staying in Kansas city, Kevin Salvador Perez, he hits the IL as well. After having surgery to repair his thumb but he is expected to be back at some point this year, you know, probably closer to August, September. Are you holding him where you have him because of the fact that he could and will come back? Or is it just going to be too little, too late, and you're just going to cut bait now for the roster spot? Because he is still is a catcher. And in most, especially in two catcher leagues, you're not holding three catchers most of the time. No, and I'm not now either, unfortunately. The optimistic the timeline is eight weeks. That gets us, we just talked about, we're almost to July. So that gets us to almost September. If it's the minimum of what they're hoping. The caveat to this is, I was thinking about this earlier today. If we were to do a 30 round draft today with seven bench spots, would Salvador Perez get drafted? That's the exercise to do right here. If you're, I think drop most him, definitely right. he would, but we would be drafting teams that everybody else is healthy. Right. So there may be a team or two out there. It's none of the teams. I have Salvador Perez on a lot of teams. None of them are healthy enough that I can hold on to him. If I happen to have a healthy team in one of those leagues, I'm snatching him up. Doesn't mean I'll be able to hold him for the next two months. If I get stuck with injuries, then I have to drop him too. But if I have a fairly healthy team where I have that stash spot that we talk, talk about in the off season, I wouldn't think of it any differently right now. And I would grab him because he could hit seven, eight home runs, even if it's only September in the catcher spot. The So that's the thing. And then on the other hand, then we got to really keep an eye on things. He's one of these guys that, we get to towards the end of July, then he might be back in four weeks. Is my do I have a spot? You want to start snagging him up a little early in the leagues he is available if you can. Yeah, eventually I guess there's going to be plenty of opportunity to pick him up right away from those who do drop him. Because like you said, if the te for the teams that have the flexibility and are still paying attention, that's the key. You got to know your league. If there's there might be two or three teams that have that flexibility, but the reason they have the flexibility is because they're already checked out. So yeah. you might not have to worry about them picking 
up Perez right away, but you should probably play it safer and realize that, hey, he's probably going to get picked up. If he doesn't, like you said, take advantage, pick him up a little bit earlier. Don't wait until you hear he's going on a rehab assignment because it's probably going to be too late. All right, another IL stint, of course. That's the theme of news and notes typically on the show. Manuel Margot, he hit the 60-day IL with a right knee sprain for Tampa Bay. So what kind of impact does his absence have on the Tampa Bay outfield? And is he an easy drop due to the length of time he's going to be missing, even in deeper leagues? Yeah, easy drop due to the length and a gift for those that were looking ahead and picked up Josh Lowe over the past two or three weeks in anticipation of his return, which he has returned. But this solidifies his playing time. Josh Lowe is 96% rostered in main events, so there's a couple of main event leagues where he's available, and he's available in 80% of Rotowire Online Championship leagues, the 12-teamers. This makes Josh Lowe a hot commodity for this weekend. Let's see if he goes for more than he did the first time around for those who didn't draft him. That would be an interesting obviously a lot less money to play with this time of year than when he came up the first time, but it would be interesting if percentage wise to see if, if anything changes there. All right. We finally, we do have it. Speaking of the trade deadline should have worked this in a little bit better. I would have got a better segue. We actually did get a trade this week. The giants traded Steven Duggar to the Rangers for DH slash part-time outfielder, Willie Calhoun, not an infielder. Does this move make either of these players actually interesting for this weekend's fab? Not this weekend, but it's something to keep an eye on. Neither of these guys has played at the major league level since April. They would they had both been sent down weeks ago by their respective teams. I'm interested in what Willie Calhoun might be able to do with the Giants. Of course, it's going to be in a platoon role. That's what they do. I think going the other way, Steven Duggar is probably just a depth piece for the Rangers. Their outfield's pretty set right now, especially with the way Adelis Garcia has been performing and even Cole Calhoun has been playing well as well. So I I think Steven Duggar is depth, a veteran depth piece for the Rangers. But San Francisco might think they can do something with Willie Calhoun, so it's something to keep an eye on. All right, so we didn't talk about minnesota's lineup we didn't talk about (laughs) cincinnati's outfield which i'm impressed for both of those things but we will talk about the mets rotation here real quick because carlos carrasco left his start early this week with lower back tightness what impact on the mets rotation could there be or will there be if he is out for more than a bit it really means that they are counting on Scherzer returning as we're expecting tomorrow, I believe it once again, Siemens David Peterson spot in the lineup who did perform well earlier in the week. And even with both of those guys back DeGrom is still doing, he's still got a ways to go Uh, 20 pitch bullpen session. I believe his first outing versus live hitters. So a step in the right direction. We would think if he gets his pitch count built up, they will not, need a long rehab start but the Mets and I want to double check real quick what their lead is in the NL East they don't care what Jacob deGrom does for between (laughs) now and September they want Jacob deGrom of course he's going to pitch prior to the postseason if he's healthy enough to do but getting him back for the postseason and having him healthy and Scherzer healthy that that could be that's a World Series team If those guys are at the top of your rotation, that's why they were signed. So they're not going to push to Grom here. I really don't know where I would be looking for the Mets to go in this situation. They've been having a bullpen day here and there. I could see that to continue. I could see guys like Drew Smith getting a few more innings here and there. Some more two and three inning appearances. He's pitched well this season. Trevor Williams got the start the other day in one of their bullpen days. And I guess when you have the lead they have and the offensive lineup that they have, the way it's been performing, they have that luxury to be able to do it that way, at least in the immediate future to see how things work out. Yeah. Some of the work, I I can't see DeGrom being forced back early for a myriad of reasons. Yours being the most, the most, 
prevalent, of course, there's no need. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, DeGrom has his opt-out option after this year as well. If I were him, I wouldn't want to be pushed back early. I'd want to just shove in for a month of regular season and then shove in the playoffs and then be like, well, look, I can shove. (laughs) I'm going to opt out and get my money. So I I would not be expecting him. Are you knowing that? Are you still holding DeGrom anywhere? I just traded for him in a keeper league, but we have IL spots. Keepers league too. Yes. And I have IL spots. And it was, it's funny. It was a throw in. He was who the guy was. He was who the guy was shopping. I wanted someone else and that, no one cares about that. But anyway, <laughs> I don't have him on any NFBC teams, any of my fan tracks leagues with limited IL spots. No, mm-hmm. but I didn't draft him anywhere either. Yeah, I don't. I'm pretty sure I have zero exposure on NFBC. I've got him in one or two places. We have him in our podcast league, but he's been obviously sitting in the IELTS, but that's a Yahoo leagues. Plenty of options to stash him there. All right, that's going to wrap it up for our news and notes section of this episode. As always, we I'm sure we missed a whole bunch of stuff, including the combined no hitter against the Yankees and a bunch of other stuff to keep up all the news of the day. Make sure you're listening to the first pitch podcast with Chad Young, Scott Chu, Daniel Port, and now Kevin Hastings joining the crew over at first pitch. They break down the news highlights and observations from every day's worth of games, as well as they look ahead at each slate to keep you up to date with everything you need to know to win your fantasy league. We are going to move right along, Kevin, and get into our recommendations. As no guest today, we're going to streamline this a little bit, skip our focus topic, get right into our recommendations. Before we do that, we are still going to take this quick break. Hey, Alex Fast here, and thanks for listening to this podcast on the Pitcher List Podcast Network. If you're a fan, consider supporting all of us by getting a PL Plus subscription, where you're going to get an ad-free website and get access to our Discord, where you can talk to all of our podcast hosts and staff. Plus, you can hang out with our incredible Pitcher List community. It's basically a baseball sanctuary year-round for as low as $8 a month. You can sign up at pitcherlist.com backslash plus, and you're going to get your first month free with promo code podcast. Also, don't forget to check out everything else we do as well from YouTube videos, live streams, newsletters, off-season articles, TikToks, breakdowns, over 15 baseball podcasts on our network. We can't stop talking about baseball even during the off-season. So sign up for PL Plus today at pitcherlist.com backslash plus and use promo code podcast to get your first month free. All right. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the show. All right, we are back. You are listening, of course, to On The Wire. That's what it says on your playlist, on your podcast player. I am Adam Howe. We have Kevin Hastings with us today, of course. And that's it, just us. And we are going to break down some recommendations for your consideration for Fab this week based on what you are looking for, for categories, whether it's some power, whether it's some speed, maybe some strikeouts, whatever you need. Hopefully we got at least a consideration for you here. Make sure you're also reading Kevin's companion article that comes out on pitcherlist.com every Sunday afternoon. I think around two o'clock, I think is your set time, Kevin. So check that out as well. We are going to get right into it, though. We'll stay in our normal order, Kevin. We are going to stick with some power home runs, RBIs. Who do you like to hit a couple bombs for us this coming week? It's not going to be this coming week, but... (laughs) He is starting his rehab assignment tonight. Eddie Rosario is with Gwinnett tonight, AAA affiliate for Atlanta. And early in the season, when we finally heard after 15 games of him hitting .068, I don't even know how to to say that. We say he's batting 68. That doesn't sound right. (laughs) Oh, 68. And when we finally heard what the injury was, we were like, they can't see the baseball. How can he hit? Because this is a guy that still last season with Atlanta for a part of the season, that he was one of the outfielders they acquired, helped them go on to a World Series title, 14 home runs and 11 stolen bases in just 111 games. Also 62 RBI in those. We're talking a guy with a 20 home run, 100 RBI pace for a full season while hitting 259. Projections in 180-ish 
plate appearances for all the projection systems. I'll look specifically at the bat X, which I typically like to do with hitters. 251 to hit the rest of the season. Six home runs, three stolen bases, low 20s, both RBI and runs. If he's coming back next week, he's going to play more than 44 games the rest of the season. Adam Duvall's been hor- horrible for Atlanta. It's why we've seen Michael Harris, the second stick in the lineup, and he's performing well. Adam Duvall's still playing every day now that Ronald Acuna Jr. is back to the outfield and Marcelo Zuna is DHing. He's not hitting either. So if Eddie Rosario comes back, he's going to get more than these 180 plate appearances. And then we're looking at double digit home runs, a handful or more stolen bases and more like half a season of his 90 RBI 70 run scored pace down to for half the season, the rest of the way. So got to grab him. Got to grab him this week because they did say he needs several rehab games. Obviously, they want to make sure that the vision is corrected and he's performing. But next week, if he does perform and we have an announced date that he's coming back, he'll be much more expensive next week than this week. Yeah, I like that. Getting ahead of the curve. We talked about that with Salvador Perez when he does go when he gets dropped inevitably. Look for him before he finishes up his rehab starts. Like you said. 17% 17% rostered across main events, still uh, plenty of time. I would expect that percentage in main events to be 80% or higher after tomorrow night. And the 12 teamers, less so. 40 to 50%, <laughs> they'll wait a little longer. Mm-hmm. They really like to churn each week. But the main event 15 team leagues, I bet that percentage is 80% or higher after, after Sunday evening. Well, somebody I was looking at for some power for me when I was looking into him I fit into the opposite of the Seth Brown conundrum that you put out there for some bases not a guy I make I would typically think I'm going to put into the power category here but lo and behold fits that's Lane Mm -hmm. Thomas Nationals leading off for the majority of the month of course going up against a whole bunch of right-handed pitchers they faced that sorry left-handed pitchers where they faced six out of ten for a stretch and he was batting a leadoff throughout that but he moves. He's moving down on the order as they face five sh- straight right-handed pitchers recently. Back in the leadoff spot today on Saturday, as we're recording this. But of course, moving down in the order gives him more RBI opportunities. in In the month of June, he has a top thirty slugging percentage of qualified batters through twenty games, eighty two plate appearances. It's just shy of Salvi. Uh, barely better than Glaber Torres, who's been hitting the ball quite well himself, and. He's just hitting the ball really hard in general. 43% hard hit rate in June and a more accurate hard <laughs> hit rate of hard contact percentage at 27.6% all season above average, above the average of 26.3 across Major League Baseball shows that this is something that's been sustainable for him for a while. He is readily available in 12 teamers, 57% rostered, over 40% of leagues he is out there. He's 98% roster in main event, so there's one or two leagues out there. But he's only been starting, at least this past week, in 60% of those leagues. So if you got him in your roster, this is the time you need to move him back into your starting lineup and take advantage of that high slugging percentage of the power that he has been showing. And he's got an even split of left-handers and right-handed starters coming up this coming week. So he should move around, I think, in the lineup, not just seeing in the top of the order, but he should move around from four. He played, he, he batted fifth, he batted eighth, he batted first. So he's all over the place. So he should get a different looks throughout the course of the week and more oper- RBI opportunities for in some situations. Obviously, if he's at the top of the lineup, more run opportunity, less RBIs there, especially in the Washington lineup, but should have a, a flux of opportunities going forward. What are your, uh, do you have any thoughts on Lane Thomas in this category? Is this a category that you would have considered for him? Yeah, absolutely. And looking ahead, the schedule's nice too. Even though they have a four game set over the weekend with Miami, they are off this Thursday. So that takes them into the following scoring period. So they have one more home game versus Miami next Monday. But then they get a series at Philadelphia and Atlanta, a couple of nice ballparks as well. Mm-hmm. So that's an even added bonus there. There you go. 
All right, we got some power. Let's get some speed, Kevin. As I mentioned, I'm going to cop out here and just say Dylan Moore was my pick here. Uh, CJ Abrams, if available as well. He's playing a little bit more regularly. I'm not sure if that will hold up. And he hasn't actually been stealing bases, but everybody and their cousin knows he can and probably should be. So CJ Abrams, if he is available in your league, is probably worth a flyer, especially in the speed category. But uh, Kevin, I think you got somebody that's a little bit more... uh, more guaranteed of playing time, I think. Yeah, finally, right? right? Jaron Duran <laughs> with the Red Sox. We've been flirted with a couple times, but it's been for to cover a paternity leave and an, another injury, and he's been back up since June 15th. He's hit leadoff and played center field. He is the leadoff hitter and the center fielder for the Boston Red Sox now. They've gotten on base not quite what they would hope from their leadoff hitter, Coming into today, that was at 313, but he was on base again today because he got his third stolen base today now in just nine games since taking over the leadoff spot and the center field position for the Red Sox. I think he's going to hold the spot going forward if he can at least maintain his on-base percentage that he has so far, and he should improve it as he gets more used to this spot. And yeah, definitely. This is what we know we can do. We, Like I said earlier in the season, I think part of his issue late last year when he got called up and early this year, he had all kinds of distractions to deal with. The Japan, the Olympics, everything going on. But the power that came out of nowhere, it seemed, at AAA last year, I think might have gotten his head. But now it's uh, get on base and steal bases. And that's what he's doing. And I see, I look for that to continue. Yeah. Speaking of the Red Sox, I'm actually really glad to see that Jeter Downs was sent back down to triple A after getting the call up playing in one game going over four, just because I really don't want anybody out there tempted to pick up Jeter Downs and think that they're getting a former <laughs> top prospect at this stage in his career. He is just not, he's not going to do it for you. All right. He has the potential still. But he has uh, he's been struggling quite a bit. So keep that in mind when they inevitably bring him back up, up and down throughout the course of the summer. But I love obviously Duran with much more guaranteed playing time leading off for the Red Sox for a pretty decent offense. Going to have plenty of opportunities to score runs there. All right, let's move on to our opportunity section before we do that. Of course, let's highlight some schedule notes for the, your consideration as you're debating on who to highlight in your waterfall bids and who uh, who might be getting to the top of those. There are eight teams that have a seven game. Sorry, there are 10 teams that have at least a seven game week ahead of them. That is the uh, Yankees, Toronto, Tampa Bay, Cleveland, Minnesota, Oakland, Seattle, Pittsburgh, and the Dodgers with uh, Cleveland, Minnesota having a doubleheader on Tuesday. That gives them eight games on the week. Toronto and Tampa Bay have a doubleheader on Saturday, which gives Toronto eight and Tampa Bay seven, despite having the off day earlier on in the week. So keep an eye on that. A lot more opportunities for plate appearances and, of course, innings pitched as well, especially on those doubleheaders. Colorado, as I typically will highlight, they, again, are at home for all six games of their work week this week. They host the Dodgers for three and then Arizona for the weekend series. And then there are three teams that only have two scheduled days off next week, and that is Arizona, the Mets, and Detroit. They all have two days off in the first half of your lineup locks, especially on the NFBC format. So with that in mind, Kevin, who who's going to take advantage of their situation that they have in front of them this week? Okay, I'm looking ahead here with a couple of guys. Also, I'm speculating. I've talked a couple of times this season about how much I like how Alexander Chase talks about hard contact rate instead of hard hit rate over at pitcher list on the leaderboards. I don't know exactly when this was added. I know he had been talking about it being added. Hard contact rate had been on the player pages all season long. It's now on the leaderboard, which means we can sort by hard contact rate. I talked a couple of weeks ago about being able to pull that from Savant. You don't have to anymore. It's right there on the pitcher list lever boards. Now, when I sort by hard contact rate, some of the names you would expect are right at the top. Jordan Alvarez, number one. Aaron Judge, number two. Jose Abreu, Rafael Devers, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. This is what we would expect to see in a stat like this. 
Now, with minimum plate appearances for the season set at 50, we go down and we see a couple of guys that are really intriguing to me because the first thing I look at after that hard contact rate is ground ball rate. If the ground ball rate is really high, it's not really doing us a lot of good. But number seven in the league in only 69 plate appearances, but now playing every day for the Detroit Tigers is Victor Reyes. Victor Reyes is seventh in the league in hard contact percentage. He's hitting the ball on the ground less than 50% of the time, 47.2% to be exact. They are one of the teams with the five-game week this week that you just mentioned. We haven't seen the results from this yet, and we haven't seen him steal a base yet, which is what we're really hoping for from Victor Reyes. But I think more on-base opportunities are to come, sitting at 304 on-base percentage when he's hitting the ball that hard and under that 50% ground ball rate. Victor Reyes is going to be getting on base more than that 30% of the time that he is right now. And he will start stealing bases. And we know from a couple of years ago when we, when he is in the lineup every day and we're counting on stolen bases from him, he can go out and pop a home run every now and then. So I'm looking at Victor Reyes for, to get going in two weeks from now, they have an eight game week with all of those games being played at Cleveland and at the Chicago White Sox, nice ballparks for those home runs to fly out of, especially in July, which we will be in by those time those guys being played. Same thing, another guy, this guy coming back from injury. We know the Giants move players around, but he's been leading off. He's been the DH most days since returning. Tommy LaStella is 13th in the league with a hard contact rate and only a 40% ground ball rate. We haven't seen a lot of results from this yet. He's only had 96 plate appearances, only two home runs in those appearances, but this leads me to believe there's more to come. So I like getting ahead on both of these guys and add them to my teams now where I can. I feel like Listella is just one of those guys that gets picked up like every year in bunches. Like all of a sudden he's like you said, he's 13% rostered in main event now all of a sudden he's 80% rostered like in one week. It's not gradual throughout the course of the next couple of weeks. It's like all of a sudden everybody just catches on me. Like, hey, no, that's a good one. I'm going to grab him all at the same time. So it's good to look ahead. Like you mentioned, I, I got one guy here that I never, ever thought I would put as a recommendation. I don't even These know if I recommended. Guys. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> If I'm questioning my own recommendations, though, right off the bat, that's uh, no, I'm not questioning the recommendations, just questioning the fact that I didn't ever expect it to put him on the list. So that's Kevin Biggio of Toronto, who's just having a heck of a June. He's slash line 304, 448, 587 in the month, not including today. He's going against his mantra of walking as much as he is striking out. That's a 20.3% rate as opposed to his season long K percentage, which is 297th in the league. That's not good, Bob. 28.2%, but with a third best walk rate of 17.5% in the league. So keeping the walk rate right around the same rate as he's normally bringing that K rate down to about the same, or not about to exactly the same rate. It's obviously that's going to lead to better things, hence the slash line. He's also hitting the ball harder throughout the course of the month as he was compared to April and May. A 36% hard hit percentage. I'm going to go ahead and use hard hit percentage for this one for the moment. And 43% in the month of June. So that's going up. But what I like about it is that his soft contact's not moving. So he's still at only 15% soft contact. So what it is, just all those medium contact hits are going up and not so much splitting the medium contact into both hard hit and then soft hit. He's just not flailing away at it and hoping he hits something. He's just getting more accurate with those uh, with those hits, hitting the ball harder when he is hitting the ball in, in, in those situations. His on base is still, like I said, 448, still good. He's still putting himself an opportunity most to score runs. He is, of course, batting at the bottom of Toronto lineup when he is batting. With eight games coming up for Toronto with that double header, even if he is playing at his normal rate where he's pretty much playing like two out of three games as a recently filling in at first base, filling in the second base, he still has third base eligibility as well in NFBC. So you've got that middle infield, you've got that corner infield opportunity there. 
he's going to get enough plate appearances to with an eight game slate to still warrant it, putting him in your lineup, even if he doesn't play every single day. So he has more opportunities. It's also lefty going up against seven right-handed starters throughout those eight games as it's set right now. Shane McClanahan being the only lefty he should be facing. Obviously, that's, that could change at a moment's notice, especially with Tampa Bay being one of their opponents. But with the flexibility, with the roster flexibility he's got, the number of games that Toronto has playing this week and just what he's been doing in the month of June. He doesn't really seem like he's slowing down per se heading into July. I think this is definitely worth a shot, especially he's avail- especially the fact that he's available pretty much everywhere. 21% rostered in the main event, only 6% rostered in the online championship. And just the roster flexibility alone makes him even more relevant, even in those 12 teamers where you, with all the injuries that we talk about, literally every single week to have that flexibility to put them in corner or middle at any given time is uh, is pretty valuable i like it all right so we we i think we've looked ahead enough kevin so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna we're not gonna talk about our future two-star pitchers especially since with all the injuries going on in the rotation all these uh, two-star pitchers tend to not end up being two-star pitchers <laughs> it seems the following week so let's go right into some options for wins in case this coming week but if you want to look ahead in the here too, you're more than welcome to. But you've got a couple options here, so I'm going to leave it to you here. Who's going to rack up some counting stats in your pitching categories in this week or next? Yeah, and, and I'm going to add one quickly because I had a two-start guy, but he's got a nice matchup this week as well. And that's Dylan Bundy. <laughs> but the guy we love to hate, and then we <laughs> love to love when it's going well. It's been up and down for Bundy in Minnesota now. It's pretty crazy that he started off the season and we thought he was back to what he did in 2020 after a disappointing 2021. And then he went in the tank for a little bit. Over his last couple of starts, right? 14 innings pitched, only two earned runs, and he's struck out nine. And I don't believe this is including last night when he oh yeah this does include last night the six innings pitched with two strikeouts for minnesota in a one zero ball game that one earned run he gave up that was the only run of the game i believe so he's been pitching well and when we look at the schedule he is going to get probably at cleveland this week not great not horrible we'll take it and then next week at the Chicago White Sox, which to before the season started, we would have thought, oh, no, we don't want to start a guy like Dylan Bundy at the Chicago White Sox, but they have been absolutely horrible. And then at the Texas Rangers, who actually I would worry more about than the start at Chicago, the way Texas has been playing recently, but still not a lineup that worries me. So I like Dylan Bundy. He's only rostered in 68, 68% of the 15 team main events. I like Dylan Bundy. A couple of other guys that I had down here. Jonathan Heasley from Kansas City had a pretty nice outing going earlier this week. He was left in one inning too long. He has a two-start week coming up this week. It appears he will get the Texas Rangers, but in Kauffman Stadium and then at Detroit. They do have an off day Thursday. It is possible that we might not see him until the following Monday. In that case, then we'd be looking at him getting being at Houston and Cleveland back at Kaufman for a two-start week next week. Houston's been heating up. There for a while, it was like, ah, Houston the isn't as bad as it sounds. But their lineup has been performing much better recently. So probably not for this week, but I would use him at home in Kauffman Stadium against the Rangers this week. And I also like Jose Quintana. Quintana has been good all season long. And I think it's the name. I think it's what he did after being traded for Eloy Jimenez and Dylan Cease. And we got a bad taste in our mouth of what Jose Quintana is. He's been good all season for the Pirates. He's only rostered in 66% of main events, 16% of the 12-team online championships. 
and 11% on Yahoo. He gets two starts this week at Washington. Love that matchup. And it, the Milwaukee back in Pittsburgh it isn't something scaring me away either. I really, Jose Quintana is my favorite of these by far. For those in a lot of trouble in wins and Ks and already aren't going anywhere in the ratio category, this is not for anybody that wants to protect their ratios. Patrick Corbin gets the Pirates this week. <laughs> I'm like, where are you going with this? <laughs> the, the, even Patrick Corbin can probably squeak out a win versus the Pirates, but it's not something I do in a league where my ratios are mattering to me right now. Yeah, that's a safe statement to make. I think I stole this from Christopher Weber. Friends don't let friends stream Patrick Corbin, but <laughs> that's a that's that's a concern. It's a very specific situation in which this is a good play like you mentioned if you know your ratios aren't going to be moved that's what we're talking about. this is the category we're talking about we're not talking about ratios yet corbin's not gonna do any well he'll do something to them but he might still just do quite and just enough to justify the win in a couple case here or there but at least the win all right i'm gonna throw out a name i don't have a lot to back it up here but uh keegan thompson if he's available i think this is a decent play he's he's just showing even though he was going three four inning five innings uh throughout the course of most of the season he's gone six innings in his last two starts after coming back from a pretty terrible outing or two terrible outings back to back he did get pittsburgh last but he did take care of Atlanta right before that. And so his double tap this week is looking pretty good. He's hosting Cincinnati. So it's always good to face Cincinnati, not at great America small park, of course, in the friendly confines. Uh, but then he faces off against the Red Sox who obviously offense, you don't love the fact of facing off against them, but for the opportunity of getting that to start there, I think Keegan Thompson, who is not readily available in main events, 92% rostered across main events available in a couple of here, or there 15 teamers, and but 34% rostered across online championships. So plenty of opportunity to pick him up for the two start here. I think just for the fact of having the two start, he will be somewhat popular, especially with the back to back really strong outings he put up as of recent. It, even in a 12 teamer, if you were going to throw out 34, 35 bucks for a two star pitcher, you might want to just bring it up a little bit, especially if you have the wiggle room in your budget for somebody like that with that recent exposure. Yeah, Thompson is someone I'm fortunate enough to have on several teams because I had him due to our next category when he was performing mm -hmm. so well early in the season, a couple innings at a time. Yeah, I would expect or hope he at least get a win again in that Cincinnati, whether or not that holds against Boston as a Red Sox fan. You have to toe that line, of course, what you're rooting for and all of your spending on who you got going in all of your different fantasy leagues. But We'll see. At least you got Cincinnati, which is always nice, at least this year. Speaking of ratios, let's move right into it, Kevin. Who is going to chip away at your ERA and whip this week? The guy that is the reason we started doing this category yeah. last season, <laughs> right? We both loved Colin McHugh, and we talked about him on probably half of our episodes last season. And he started off the year giving up multiple runs in multiple outings and multiple runs in three of his first handful of outings in a third of an inning. So his numbers looked horrible. He was actually performing not well, but Colin McHugh is back to being what we expect Colin McHugh to be for Atlanta. And it even got a three inning outing today versus the Dodgers giving up no runs helping our ratios just like we expect him to do and the reason we have this category is zero percent rostered across main events and online championships i'm fortunate enough to already have him on a few draft champions leagues when i was drafting early not knowing about that first couple of weeks he was going to have this <laughs> season but it's nice that to have him there now and be able to start using him when i don't have the starting pitching depth and that's what this category is all about and worth picking up there's a lot of people that i heard jason collette's talked about it a lot of people are talking about it guys this are a lot better now than some of these fifth and sixth seventh starters that we might put in our lineups the way the ball has started flying as the 
weather is heated up. Yeah, especially in, you mentioned it earlier, like with the Mets at least, but all, multiple teams are doing it and they're having more and more bullpen days, especially throughout the course of the summer as they're either trying to stretch through injuries from their rotation or just trying to stretch out their rotation further along so they can make it through the entire summer. These bullpen games are going to play much more of a role through July and into August, I think. And we're going to see a little bit more action out of the McHughes of the world. As we talked about, our number, our 1B was Brent Suter last year. So I'll just say this is the McHugh Suter category, if you will. And so those types of players or those types of pitchers, I think are going to get utilized a little bit more often. And I think key is too, looking, we always talk about, we talk about rote bullpen usage And everybody talks about that when it comes to closers and who's next in line, who's coming in the seventh inning, who's coming in the eighth inning right behind the established closer to see who's going to be next up if that closer falters or goes on the injured list. Keeping an eye on who's the guy that's coming up first out of the bullpen and who's going to be the first guy they go to to hold a lead after the starter gets pulled, especially when the starter's getting pulled in the fourth, fifth, sixth inning because that if they're coming out with regularity at that time, they're more more likely to come in the fourth inning when you have a guy who's faltering, but the, the score is still close. Or if they were a set, they knew they were only going to go the first three innings and they were going to do bullpen game the rest of the time. If they're the first ones up, obviously they're in line for the win. Unless you're like, Unless you're the scorer for the Yankees who determined that Clay Holmes didn't deserve the win <laughs> after the uh, getting after blowing the save and giving it giving it to Willie Peralta instead. Ah, the fact that he couldn't have just given it to Cole was obviously a tra- travesty in and of itself. It is what it is. It's just too bad because absolutely nobody rosters Willie Peralta. So nobody got the win in that game. And Willie Peralta would have gotten the save in that game, giving the win to Clay Holmes. So Willie Peralta gets the win, but no save. And um, you briefly alluded to it during news and notes and the fact that Garrett Cole could not get the win in that game. And then the Yankees got no hit today is just tragic. <laughs> you hate to see it. You hate, hate to, to see, see it. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about some saves then as a, as I kind of segued over to that one, Kevin, I'm going to cop out like you did last week and be like, nah, like saves. I got nothing. Not this week. As the fact that Kendall Graveman hasn't gotten a save is really annoying me <laughs> in the last week where Joe oh, Kelly comes in and gets the save instead. I get it. It was the whole Graveman came in, the faced the middle of the order, including Vlad was leading off, and they had a three-run lead. So even if Joe Kelly comes in and blows out two runs, which he did, which everybody expected him to do, he'll still do enough to say to save the victory but graven still hasn't gotten an opportunity since so much sense just so much of the bullpen usage we see now makes Mm -hmm. sense and we've known this for years but as fantasy players it's not what we want to see but we would think the one guy yeah. That would not pull this on us would be Tony LaRusa. You, you think you have some kind of expectation, some kind of predictability, Tony. No, no. Just throwing those curveballs. The one time he decides to do the smart thing. Right. <laughs> Probably just so much pressure. Even he has to succumb to some pr- amount of pressure. Tony, just do this with your bullpen, man. Just do this. <laughs> Fine. All right. Who you got, Kevin? Who's who you looking at? Either it's a stash or could walk into some saves next week. The guy in Boston is Tanner Hawk, but we've thought that before. We've thought it should be. We've seen him move around. He might be a starter. We re- don't really know. John Schreiber got his second save of the season this week, and I did not realize until I was looking uh, at th- that outing how good John Schreiber has been this season. He's given up two earned runs in 22 and a third innings pitched. They were actually in the same outing. He gave up a home run versus Baltimore clear back on May 27th. That's the only two that he's given up all season long. And he's got 28 appearances on the season or 23, excuse me, 23 appearances on the season. Those 22 and a third innings pitched, 26 strikeouts. His ERA is 0.81, and his whip 
is a, it's minuscule. It's like 0.5 something. We may see more opportunities here. Earlier in the week was the first time all season that Tanner Houck had been allowed to pitch on back-to-back days. So even if he is the preferred guy in the ninth inning, we still may see Schreiber getting some opportunities anyway. And then again, they, Boston may decide they want to try to stretch Houck out again as well. Yeah, I saw that. I heard your notes on first pitch about that after he got the save Schreiber did. And I wrote up Houck when he got a save earlier in the week. He'd been used three out of four days. So I wasn't expecting him to come back out later on in the week, at least not on Tuesday. But So that's not too surprising there. But as you mentioned, with Houck not really being quote allowed to go uh, back-to-back days, uh, th- there's still going to be opportunities. Boston's still going to win games, and they're still going to need somebody in there. Schreiber has been one of the only bright spots of that bullpen in Boston that we've seen all season long beyond how can even how struggled this uh, in his last outing, if I'm not mistaken. We'll, uh, we'll see how things work out. There are definitely worse stashes in bullpens that you could take by picking up a guy who's at the very least producing so if you do find yourself in a pinch and you have to throw him in your lineup, even if he's not going to walk himself into a save, he's not going to hurt you. He's going to be the Colin McHugh of the world, if you will. He's still going to get it. He's still going to get his work in. All right. We got all our typical categories. Kevin, you have any wild cards out there to spec- worth speculating on based on not any particular thing that we talked about this episode? I got one. And... He's not hitting as many home runs this season in the minor leagues as I would have expected, but he's not performing horribly either. And you would think I'm the Boston Red Sox fan (laughs) on the show tonight, but Bobby Dahlbeck's just not getting it done. Franchi Cordero has done all right. He stayed healthy longer than we probably expected he would. But I still think at some point this season, we see Tristan Casas in Boston and the Super 2 deadline is most definitely passed by now. So that is no longer the issue. So anytime now coming up, I wouldn't mind seeing Tristan Casas in Boston. I also would not mind seeing Tristan Casas in Boston. That would be nice. Somebody I'm not really, it'll be in rare situations where I end up going out of my way to pick him up. But somebody I really is Jace Peterson in Milwaukee. He's playing regularly. We thought he would get his playing time cut down after Luis Rice came back from his short injury. And now with Mike Rousseau back in the fold as well, he might consider continue to see that. But with Hunter Renfro being injured, Lorenzo Kane out of the picture there, Jace Peterson is quietly putting up a very pro- uh, productive uh, season. Nothing worth sh- writing home about per se, but just the fact that he has that almost every position eligibility, as we talked about with Kevin Biggio, but he add outfield into the mix. So available at first, second, third, and outfield. So you got your outfield, you got your corner, you got your middle, you got that flexibility in there. He's still available in over 50% of online championships. And though he is fully rostered in the main event, he's somebody that you don't necessarily think of in those shallow leagues because he's not putting up wow numbers. But one thing that he is that he had been doing throughout the course of the season was he was always an option to steal bases. And something that I've been really focusing on throughout the course of the season myself, as most people are in need to do. He does take advantage of over 11% of his opportunities throughout the course of the season. And he gets more opportunities per plate appearance than the average hitter does that with a 38% or 383 stolen base opportunity per plate appearance. So he is getting the opportunities where he's getting on base and the base is open in front of him. So something to consider, especially if you need the flexibility, he is playing pretty regularly. He's playing about three or four days straight. He'd get a day off three or four days straight, filling in mostly at third base right now, but it doesn't matter where he's playing in Milwaukee for your fantasy team. You can play him everywhere but catcher and shortstop so far this season. Who knows? Maybe he gets to fill in at a shortstop at some point this season. I, I doubt it. Who knows? So Jace Peterson, somebody to keep in consideration, especially if you need that extra flexibility moving forward. All right, Kevin, let's 
finish this off, man. Where do we stand at this part of the year? What, we, what kind of words of wisdom do you have for us? All right. If you play in a league that I'm in, stop listening right now in the episode. I thought about keeping my mouth shut about this, but the baseball scheduling gods or the baseball schedulers, whatever you want to say, have given us a gift this season. I don't know if people have realized this. Obviously, I do know many people have not realized this or at least not realized the implications of this. It's been since it's been over a month since May 16th that the Colorado Rockies did not play a full week at home or a full week on the road. They don't do it again until well into August. They only do not play every game at home or every game on the road for a scoring period twice the entire rest of the season. And now there, there is far more reaching implications this than people realize. People are like, oh, some of these guys you should play anyway. Nope. No, you shouldn't, with one exception. And that exception is not C.J. Crone, as many people might think when they look at his overall numbers. The exception is Charlie Blackman. He's a wise old man. He knows how this works. He knows the ball moves differently, and he doesn't produce as well on the road, but it's passable. Uh, on the road, Charlie Blackman has hit 252 with five home runs, 20 RBI, 12 runs scored. So for a season, that's a 20 home run, 80 RBI, a 50 to 60 run scored guy with a 252 average passable, but in sure. many leagues, that's still not good enough, right? Even Charlie Blackman can be benched for many teams, depending on your format, who else you have on your team. Nobody else should be in your lineup for the Colorado Rockies when they're on the road. And for the rest of the season, seven weeks, we get out of 14 full weeks that we have remaining. That's not counting the half week that we have after the all-star break, but it's mind boggling. When you look at this, Ryan McMahon is having a pretty good year when they're at home. He's got one home run and 11 RBIs on the road, right? Ryan McMahon was started in 100% of main event leagues and 88% of online championship leagues this week. And this is what he's done for the season on the road. They were on the road all week. It boggled my mind when I saw that. It's just crazy. CJ Crone who you would think comes close, four home runs, 13 RBI, 13 runs scored. Eh, that's a 15 home run guy, 65 RBI, 65 runs scored with a 217 batting average. You're better off with Eric Hosmer in your lineup. Literally, you are better off with Eric Hosmer than CJ Crone as a corner infielder on those days. Now, let's just bring up the good with this. Just 13 home runs, 39 RBI and 32 runs scored, all right? Now we're talking a 52 home run, 160 RBI, 120 run scored guy if he was playing every game for an entire season in Coors Field. And it hasn't even got hot in Colorado yet. So that is the difference we're looking at with a guy like CJ Crone. He is absolutely 100% a must start and we have been given a gift that we have been told by the schedulers exactly when to put him in our lineup for the week. And nobody, I, it, looking at the starting percentages in, in the different formats I was looking at, people are not taking advantage of it. It goes beyond, that's an extreme, like you mentioned, 100% started for Ryan McMahon. But it also goes to say who's paying attention in your leagues and who's not whether or not they're going as deep as you just went, or if they're just setting and forgetting it every single week. That's something to keep an eye on in your league as you're going through who's like who's a threat and who's not a threat. So this is not even so much, I think, a message to those of us who roster these players to make sure that you are staying on top of it, but also just keeping an eye on the teams in your leagues that roster these players and figure out if they are paying attention or they're not paying attention. So yeah, I think that's a good call. I'm glad I, you didn't I don't I'm glad it, you didn't keep your mouth shut, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually not this simple. We're we're lucky oh, sure. in, in FBC formats where typically a series is going to be the first half of the week or the weekend and we can swap guys in and out in these leagues. And like I said, only two weeks the rest of the season is half of their games at home and half mm -hmm. away during the same week. But the 
I don't think it's usually been this easy for us and handed to us by the schedule in the leagues where we have to set our lineup for the week. Not even for the hitters, though, for the pitchers. Like we talk about pitchers on the, you're not going to throw a pitcher in Colorado if you can avoid it, regardless of they're on Colorado or they're on the visiting team. Even all those two steps for those Colorado pitchers are always going to be on the road. You're not going to consider a two step Colorado pitcher when in a week where they're going to be at home for both starts. So it's nice to know that in, I would say we probably don't want to get used to this. This is probably (laughs) not going to be a theme for 2023. So take advantage of it while you can, if you can find ways to do. All right, that's going to wrap it up for episode 65 of on the wire. Make sure to subscribe, share and review the podcast, wherever you're listening. We will be back of course, every Sunday with a detailed fat breakdown throughout the 2022 season. Of course, keep a lookout for Kevin's companion article over at pitcherlist.com comes out every Sunday afternoon as well. So make sure you're reading through that as I'm sure Kevin will have a couple more names in there that he left out of the show. You can follow myself on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. Kevin is at Hasting Kevin. Of course, you can follow the pod itself at on the wire pod. I am Adam Howe on behalf of Kevin Hasting. Thanks for listening. And with that, we bid you goodbye.